All right, everybody. Well, thank you for being available today for this webinar. You know, it is sad that we all have to connect today for these reasons, but hopefully we can provide some information about what's going on with the stimulus or the outbreak response programs and also provide uh, what information we have to help clarify some things from you and make your process more efficient. We're going to, this is, we have a lot of questions and a lot of attendees, so we're going to try to be as efficient as possible during the webinar and also answer as many questions as we can. If you have questions during the webinar, just write them on the side in the chat question box and we will get to them during the webinar. We've also received the questions you've already sent and we will be addressing those directly during the webinar as well. So we'll be doing a combination of both and we'll try to answer as many questions as we can as we know that's an extremely important part of this webinar. Today's presenters are Rafael Martinez with, with Atlantic Union Bank. Um, Rafael has been working with us, gosh, almost, well, since the beginning of the firm, I know that, and he's been involved with commercial banking for more than 15 years. He's an expert on SBA loans, an expert on commercial banking. Um, we're really lucky to be working with him, and uh, we're excited he's part of this webinar. Eric Wilder is a senior tax manager at Wendroff and Associate CPA. He works with all our clients across all our industries, and we work with nonprofits, technology, government contractors, small business, complex individual and individual returns. So Eric has a wide breadth of knowledge and can discuss a, a, a variety of different things, and he's become the internal expert on the PPP program and the recovery programs that are available for this uh, for the outbreak. The agenda today is going to be very straightforward. We're going to talk about the uh, stimulus programs. We're going to talk about how to apply to the PPP program and the EIDL program. And then we're going to go right into questions. Uh, we're also going to give some examples of how the different programs work, how much one can qualify for with the loan and how to get it forgiven. And then of course, you know, like I said, we're gonna go right into the questions um, versus going too much into the history of the program or adding some context, though we all are quite aware that this is unprecedented. So we're just gonna start off and we're gonna go right into the payroll protection program. The larger CARES Act is a $2 trillion stimulus program, but within that program is the $349 billion small business loan program, the, P the Paycheck Protection Program. Um, this program is, was created to allow small businesses access to liquidity, to allow them uh, to give them cash flow to keep the business running during this outbreak, during uh, this unprecedented response to the outbreak, where organizations and companies had to basically close their business while we socially distance. Um, loan applications must be received before June 30th. So we have uh, about a month and a half left, May, June. Yeah, we have about a month and a half left. Uh, no, there are no SBA fees for these loan applications. There's no collateral or personal guarantees required. These are unprecedented type loans. You can apply through your local banker, which we will be addressing in the webinar because this has been difficult in some cases in terms of if your banker is being responsive or, or what to do or if you qualify to apply through your local banker. The loans are also 100% forgivable if used properly, which we will be discussing, how to use the loans properly to make sure that your loan is forgiven. The PPP terms, you can get a max loan amount up to 10 million. You have to qualify for a certain amount. If you go over that certain amount, it caps at 10 million. The interest rate for the loans has, is 1% today. This number has changed several times, so hopefully this number sticks or goes lower. But just be aware also, it brings up a really good point that I'm sure we'll mention throughout the webinar, that there's a lot of things changing with this program. And because of the nature of how quickly they release the program and the scope of the program, the, the massive scope of the program, there's gonna be a lot that changes throughout as well, I, I assume. But I think they released about, you know, maybe 80 to 90% of what the program's going to be, and then they're gonna adjust as time goes forward. Uh, the max terms for the program are two years. There are no prepayment fees. If you prepay the 
loan early. There's no penalty for that. Payments can be deferred up to six months, though interest will accrue, and there are no borrower or lender fees. Um, the next part are the application documents needed. I'm gonna have Raphael speak about this, Raf. Thank you, Darren, appreciate it. Good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Uh, I echo Darren's sentiments. It's uh, unfortunate it's under these circumstances, but our goal is to provide as much information as possible. So you're, you're here a switch back and forth between myself, Eric, and Darren to try to mix it up a little bit, not too monotone, but also provide you some, some really strong information. So this slide is about the application documents that are needed. Uh, here's a, a very good example. Uh, the IRS forms 941 for period for payroll periods ending uh, 331, 630, 930, and 1231. Also, the IRS form 930 for the year ended 1231, 2019, and the banks will require payroll reports. I won't read the, the, the three that are below here. You can read that yourself. The payroll reports will be required along with IRS forms W-2, W-3 for the year 2019. Uh, support of, you will also have to provide supporting documents if necessary, or if you're asking for more of the included and in, uh, payroll costs. So you have for supporting documents for health, dental, retired benefits paid for 2019, and schedule a schedule summarizing each category of these costs. So you're gonna to have to provide uh, very strong details to back this up when you provide your application to the bank. Uh, something else that is coming up uh, more and more as we're going through this process is financials. So your bank is not going to do full underwriting. Uh, this is more of a processing event rather than a traditional bank underwriting event. However, Banks are using the reasonableness test. So if you put in your application, you want a million dollar loan and your payroll numbers aren't adding up, uh, the bank's going to flag it. Uh, they're going to come back to you and most likely ask you to provide more supporting documents on those payroll reports. Maybe you missed something, maybe it was an honest mistake, uh, but they will also most likely ask you for some type of financials for a uh, year in 2019. So just heads up. Uh, especially if your loan is over $1 million. Darren? Oh, I'm sorry. This is still yes, Raph. Sorry, guys. <laughs> uh, sorry about that, Raph. No, I'm available now. Sorry. I apologize as well. I'm Darren Wendroff. I'm the Director of Communications for Wendroff and Associates CPA. I did not introduce myself. Um, we're an accounting firm here in Arlington, Virginia, a small business accounting firm. We work with nonprofits, government contractors, technology companies, and uh, sole proprietors and, and, and complex individual returns as well, um, complex individual tax situations as well. So thank you, yeah, thank you very much, Ralph. That's uh, uh, been, has been some questions in terms of the, the application documents needed. If you, and by the way, we are getting your questions and we will post answers to these. Uh, uh, we will we will address these questions throughout the webinar. I saw Charles wrote that the slides are not advancing. I do see them advancing, Charles, in the view. If anyone does not see them advancing, please let me know. We are on the PPP application documents needed slide right now. So next, what we'll be going to is how to calculate your loan amount. And to speak about this will be will be Eric Wilder, our senior tax manager. Eric. Uh, yes, thank you. Thanks, Aaron. So this is uh, <clears throat> not as this. This is going to be the boiled down version of it. I think just about everybody is going to have some sort of complex, you know, uh, situation that's going to you know, be tailored to their situation. But this, the max loan amount, ten million dollars, is as uh, Raphael said a little bit ago. Um, to calculate this. It's based off of two and a half months of your your average payroll expenses. <clears throat> now that it's two and a half months qualified expenses for a 12 month period prior to to applying for the loan. Uh, most people that we've been working with have just been using the calendar year 2019 financials and payroll reports. You've got those. You've got the W2s. You've got the W3s. Payroll summaries for the year uh, should tie to your your financials. <clears throat> I, I uh, 
caution everybody on this. When you're using, um, you've, you've gathered your information, 941s, 940s, W2s, these are not always going to tie to each other. Um, employees can have pre-tax benefits that aren't reported on their W-2, so their W-2 could easily be lower. I trust the summary reports from your payroll provider. That's going to capture gross wages more accurately, and that's the figures you're going to use. Um, salaries, wages, commissions, everything you've paid them for, for gross wages. Um, <clears throat> now, the calculation you're going to take your total pay, payroll for the year. Now, each person is going, to, each individual is capped at one hundred thousand dollars. So, if you have some uh, high earners that are over the hundred thousand for payroll only, this does not include benefits uh, for the hundred thousand dollars. <throat> you'll cap their pay at a hundred k. So, certain individuals you'll have to back out the wages over a hundred thousand dollars for this calculation. So once you've taken your gross total payroll for the year, back out anything over 100K for individuals making over that amount, <clears throat> then divide that number by 12. That'll give you your average monthly payroll and multiply that number by 2.5. This is gonna be your maximum loan amount. <clears throat> um, at that, I'm sorry, I skipped a little step here. You're gonna Divide that number by 12. Um, sorry, take your take your payroll summary, for your total payroll. Back out anything over 100k, and we have some examples for this. On the next couple of slides we'll get to, um, and add your your benefits to that. Then divide by 12, multiply by 2.5. So we'll we'll skip to this next uh, slide that'll better illustrate this. Darren, you're going to have to skip that for me. Sorry about that, Erica. I was on mute. Real quick, we have some questions. Um, let's answer a couple of these questions. Do you want to go to the next slide, Eric, which is how the loans can be used, or do you want, and then we'll go, we'll answer the questions, or should we answer the questions first? Uh, it doesn't matter to me. Let's see what they, let's, uh, let's skip to the next one, and maybe that'll clarify some questions for it. Okay, they don't they don't address this, but we'll we'll get to the questions after this slide. All right, Darren. So this is my slide. Uh, this is Raphael again from Atlantic Union. Uh, how the how how are you supposed to use this loan? So it's a very specific uh, program. It's the Paycheck Protection Program. So it's written in the name. This is for uh, payroll. The intent here is to keep employees on board, rehire quick. Let's go over some of the big bullet points here. Payroll costs, including benefits, that's that's what you can use a loan for. Interest on mortgage obligations incurred before February 15th, 2020. So I do ask that you pay attention to some of these, these dates. They are specific and they must be met in order for you to get full uh, forgiveness of the loan. And we'll go through that in a couple of the slides, but just it's a good idea to start writing down some of these dates. Uh, rent under lease agreements is enforced before 15, 2020. So rent, you can do rent. And utilities, again, that started before February 15th. That's that's a big cutoff point here. Um, the goal is for you to cover two months worth of payroll and a little bit extra that can be used uh, towards these other eligible costs uh, as part of the Paycheck Protection Program. Okay, so we have a couple questions I wanna ask and then we'll get more into the loan forgiveness part, Ralph, but I have some questions for you and Eric. So this question is from Nancy. She says, we use a PEO to do our payroll. We pay all costs plus a processing fee to the PEO. We do not have 941 or 940 forms. They only give us quarterly reports, which they can download, but not actual forms. What should they do if they're in that situation? Uh, I'll take that first, Eric, if that's okay. So, so there's a little bit of gray area here. The intent is for you to provide some type of supporting documents for your payroll. If you're in that situation, you don't get the 941, that's okay. It's not a hard uh, requirement. It's kind of best practice. Most companies have it, but if you don't, you need to provide what you have and give it to the bank. Each bank is, again, doing the reasonable test. If you're able to provide documentation that supports your loan amount, 
you'll most likely get through. Again, this is a processing event, not a traditional credit underwriting event. As long as you meet the eligibility requirements and you pass the reasonable test when you apply for your loan and can prove it, you're okay. You will get the money. So, no, thank you, Ralph. Thank you, thank you. Um, so we had another question here. Uh, I'm just gonna answer this one. Jonathan, his question was, what documents are needed for sole proprietor, partnerships, independent contractors? Jonathan, we'll be talking a little bit more about that in the example, but actually, and Eric, Raph, you, you all can answer this a bit as well, but in terms of the, the documents you'll need, if you have a 1099, that will be used. What if they don't have a 1099, uh, Raph, Eric? Other uh, tax return. They have you to have mean some. for uh, uh, sole proprietors, if they, yeah, yeah, uh, mm -hmm. financial reports, profit and loss yep. statement, mm -hmm. uh, tax return showing a Schedule C from last year. Um, both both of those will uh, show income. I mean, the worst case scenario, bank statements at a minimum, but that's going to be pretty hard to get past that reasonable test. You have to have at least something. Uh, Schedule C tax returns filed for 2019 or financials, something. Again, you can go so in with bank if you want, but it's... Yeah, we'll get to the, uh, the calculator. Right, right. So definitely, I mean, you know, this, this webinar has been open to everyone and we're working with our clients to make sure they have the correct documentation, but this is a situation where you have to work with your accountant to make sure you have the correct documentation and also your banker. And usually in this and these times the accountant might be more available than the banker. But the key thing is that you have reasonable, you provide reasonable documents, you show reasonable need for, or reasonable uh, documentation for the loan. It, would that be correct, Raf? A correct, correct way correct. to think about that's, it? That's, that's absolutely right. I think uh, all banks for the most part are using this reasonable test, at least Atlantic Union Bank is. Again, I'll keep harping on it, excuse me for the redundancy, but it's a processing event, not an underwriting event. So you got to have your paperwork, you got to sign your application, you got to uh, uh, give us a loan amount based on the right calculation, and you got to provide us documentation to support that loan amount. And if it's reasonable after initial review, you will move on and you will get this loan. Again, if you're putting in a million dollars and your and your supporting documents do not reflect that much, you're, it's not you're not going to go through. And Raf, just real quick. Re related to that, if someone does try to apply and they do it incorrectly, are they going to get bounced back or do they get to apply again quickly? How does that work? Uh, Darren, that's a tough one. It's Again, it's a bank by bank basis. and Maybe it's a good time for me to get on a pedestal a little bit here. Uh, I've been in banking for almost ugh, 16 years. It's amazing. Um, and and I, nobody's, I'm not trying to throw a pity party for bankers or the banking industry, but this is certainly unprecedented at times. Uh, there is a crushing level of demand right now. Um, the, the smaller community banks may not have the internal bandwidth to support it. And on the flip side, the big banks are just getting drowned by the volume. Uh, so much so, some of the big banks are stopping their participation or limiting their participation. Uh, I'm not going to call any names, banks out by name, but some have put out a guidance where they're only taking certain clients over a certain, they have certain relationships with them. Uh, Atlantic Union Bank, my bank, I can speak to the fact that we're taking all of our clients first. Uh, we want to make sure they, their, needs, their needs are met, regardless of whether they have a loan or not. First come, first serve. You get in the queue, you provide us your documents, we'll get you through the process. And there's, there's other banks that are doing the same. Um, but this, these are unprecedented times. There's just, just a crush of demand right now. So uh, do be patient uh, as we get through it. These are really good times to lean on a banking relationship. If you have a banker, not just a bank, even better, uh, so they can kind of uh, hold your hand uh, to the best of their ability. Again, this program is so new that us banks, I'm, I'm learning about it as we go. I don't have this down pat. I don't consider myself an expert just because I haven't, it's just so brand new and it's so fluid that things are changing at all times. But again, your first stop with this program is your bank. If you're not getting any response or you're not feeling the love, uh, certainly reach out to some other banks to see what their bandwidth is to start taking new clients right now. So that's a long-winded answer, Darren. I, I apologize for that. Sure, sure. No, it is it is very unprecedented for the banks, everyone. Um, definitely reach out to your accountant as well. Um, the accountants can always recommend you to another bank. We can talk to our own banking contacts to see who has capacity. But it is one of these situations where 
it got the program got released and then instantly everybody had to respond and we're talking about everybody in the country pretty much so it's been very you know it's 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 been a bit of a, a bottleneck but we are seeing a lot of progress i will say that so it's not it's not all bad it's just it's a bit frustrating right now at the beginning for, for some okay so next steps let's go to the how much of the loan can be forgiven and i do see everyone's questions we will be getting those as we move forward all right there so this is my slide again uh, so how much of the loan can be forgiven? You can have 100% of the loan forgiven if at least 75% is used for qualified payroll costs in an eight-week period from the date of funding, okay? So I'm not going to repeat it. It's right there in the, in the PowerPoint. But you can get 100% of this loan forgiven if you use it for the right reason. Uh, debt forgiveness is, and you can get it forgiven, and it's not, it's going to turn into a non taxable grant. So it's a fantastic program. It's as close to free money as you can possibly get. Um, I, I, I do want to put, well, that's actually on my next point here. So, how could the forgiveness be reduced? Um, your forgiveness can be reduced if you decrease your full time employment headcount. Remember, the goal here uh, is to, for you as a business owner to retain as close to 100% of your workforce as possible. Um, and, I, and I put a little caveat on there because some people are saying, or do I have to keep 100% of my workforce to get 100% forgiveness? Uh, the answer is yes, if you want 100% forgiveness. Now, if you don't keep 100% of your workforce, you can still get a portion of that loan forgiveness forgiven if it's used to uh, retain or rehire quickly. So I know that's been a question that's coming up a lot. So, so if it doesn't make sense for your business to rehire everybody for whatever unique reason you have, it's okay. But just be cognizant of the fact that you will not qualify for 100% loan forgiveness because you are not keeping 100% of your uh, full and full-time employee headcount. So just FYI. Um, your loan forgiveness will also be reduced if you decrease the salaries and wages by more than 25% for any employee they made less than $100,000 annualized in 2019. So if you penalize folks, if you ask them to take a pay cut of more than 25%, that also cannot go into the, uh, the calculation for forgiveness. So these are two very important uh, points to consider as you're going towards loan forgiveness once we get over the hump. There are any questions on that or can we move on to slide number 10? Oh, yes, Raphael. Um, what if someone hasn't filed for 2019? Can they use their 2018 return? No, no. It's very specific on 2019. So you, so if you don't have 2019, you're going to have to have your financials. You should certainly have your financials by now. It's April 8th. So hopefully you close the books on 2019 by now. Right. So you would have to have your financials for 2019. Yeah. So the program is very specific. If you go on treasury.gov, it tells you exactly what you need. In 20, and this is based off of 2019, so um, you're going to have to have something. And then in terms of workforce, in terms of the loan being forgive, forgiven, if you had 10 employers, I'm sorry, 10 employees, but 20 contractors, but the contractors don't stay with you, do the contractors count toward your, your employee count? Um, can you say that again, Derek? Yes. No. So say it. Say a company, so Eric said no, which I, I do believe the answer is no, but Eric, uh, Raph, if a company has 10 employees, full-time employees, and 20 contractors, but they lose some of the contractors but retain all the employees, does that count toward the employee count they need to maintain above 25%? So contractors are out, and I'll let Eric uh, kind of expand on it because they're really more of kind of an accounting thing. Eric, you want to take that one? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, contract, and we'll get into this in some examples in a little bit. Contractors are not going to count for this anywhere. They're not going to factor into any of your calculations as a business owner that, that pays these subcontractors. The subcontractors are self-employed, and they will apply for these loans on their own. So this is only going to be for the business owners and for W-2 pay, paid employees. In, in this particular scenario, but the independent contractors on that? fly on their own. No, great. Well, I think we'll answer some questions now as well, because we're going to give a, a PPP loan example of an S corporation. 
I will say one thing that we'll discuss later. If you're a partnership, the the guidance has been a bit murky, and we're hoping that it clears up soon. But we we will discuss that later. The guidance is a bit murky on that. So let's go to the S corporation example. Eric, can you run us through this? Yes. Yeah. So ho hopefully these next couple of slides clear up some some uh, some questions for folks. <clears throat> so this one first is a uh, an LLC taxed as an S corp. So to calculate the uh, the loan amount to apply for here. So the owner of this S corp <clears throat> pays himself one hundred and twenty thousand dollars a year. Now this is W two wages paid um, specifically W two wages. K-1 distributions do not count for these calculations here. So you're only taking W-2 uh, wages for this. So at 120,000 with five full-time employees, for this example, everybody's making $50,000 a year for $250,000 in total in uh, employee wages. Group health is $9,000 a year for all the employees. That's the gross. Now the the calculation for this total salaries is the owner one hundred thousand because wages are capped at that uh, amount so we we'll reduce by twenty thousand plus the full, five full time employees at at fifty thousand we've got three hundred and fifty thousand dollars in cash wages we'll add the nine thousand dollars in group health benefits to that so for our annual qualified expenses the three fifty plus nine. 359, we're going to divide it by 12 to get the average monthly cost, <clears throat> 29,916. Now multiply that by 2.5. This company's maximum loan amount would be $74,791. Okay, great, great. So let's talk a little bit now about um, how the loan can, uh, can uh, be forgiven. By the way, Eric, um, a question we got was, um, I have a 1099 contractor and I am an S corporation. Can this be used to assist a 1099? Well, it, the 1099s will will, call, will fill out their own their own application. Is that correct, Eric Ross? Yeah, that's that's correct. 1099ers are not going to factor into your equations at all. They they will apply for these Eric, loans on their own. Eric, They're a self-employed individual that can apply for these. Please, sir. Folks, one thing I want to put out there, um, you know, as we're going through the process, some of my clients, I've seen them put applications where they inadvertently, I mean, so, again, the program's so new, the, the information's flying out there. They put contractors on their application. We have to kick them back out to take them out. Remember, you're attesting to the uh, – to all the information that you're putting on the application. So although there's no personal guarantee, there's no this or that, you're attesting that all the information meets the criteria and eligibility. Um, so if it comes back that, that you got uh, money that wasn't supposed to be allocated, such as adding contractors and uh, self-employed individuals into your company's calculation, uh, there, when you go to get forgiveness, they're not gonna be forgiven. So just, just take your time, lean on your accounting professional, run it through your banker uh, at a high level. The bankers can't tell you how to do the calculation for lender liability issues, uh, but if you put it in there and it doesn't pass a reasonable test or they catch something, they can certainly tell you, hey, uh, take another look at this. Okay, great. Thank you, Raf. Thank you, Eric. Um, so let's move on to the next slide. I'm sorry, Eric? Darren, Darren, Darren. Hey, Darren. Uh, just, just in case I uh, didn't interpret that question correctly, I want to make sure that if you're an S-Corp and you're receiving 1099s from from uh, your clients, I want to make sure if that's what you were referring to, those 1099s that you're receiving as a, you know, if somebody is sending them to you as an S-Corp owner, those aren't factored in. It, this is purely just your W-2 wages that you're paying yourself as a as an S-Corp owner. Okay, great. That's Thank it. I you. Just Thank make you. Sure, I was understanding that question correctly. So, Eric, can you talk about how an S corp would be forgiven with the PPP loan with this slide? Yeah. So we're going to use the example from the the previous slide with 
five full-time employees with an, with an S corp. So their their monthly payroll expense was the 29,916, and they applied for almost a seventy-five thousand dollar loan. Now with them, they they had two months of payroll expenses. It's fifty-nine thousand eight thirty-two. If we take that fifty-nine thousand eight thirty-two, you know if they they re, they keep all their employees employed or rehire them and pay them what they were making before. They're only going to have two months, eight weeks is what we have to, you know, uh, meet the payroll requirement. They're going to pay $59,832. That is only eight, that's 80% of their loan. So when we spoke, Brass spoke about forgiveness a couple of slides ago, as a business owner, you've only got to spend 75% of this money on payroll needs. So right off the bat, this company easily meets it at, at 80%. Um, over, you know, they're at eighty percent over the seventy-five percent, and as long as the S corp spends fifty-six thousand zero nine oh ninety-three on payroll in eight weeks, and the rest is used used on the qualified expenses, this loan is is fully forgiven. So it's you know it's designed to for business owners to easily meet the forgiveness uh, bar here. You know, you're applying for two and a half months. You've only got to make the the two months of payroll expenses. Use the rest on rent, utilities, mortgage interest, and uh, this one would be forgiven. And Eric, to add a little caveat to that, it would be forgiven as long as you don't do the things that would reduce your forgiveness in terms of decreasing your full-time employee headcount or decreasing their salary and wages by more than 25%. Is that correct, Eric? Correct. Correct. Yeah, correct. This example is a 100% forgiven loan. Now, if they don't meet that um, floor of $56,093 because they didn't rehire everybody or they cut some salaries, to then then there's a ratio. We don't get into that in this seminar or this webinar right now, but there is a formula to calculate the reduction. But this this scenario right here would be a 100% forgiven tax-free loan right here. So we're going to be giving a 1099 example next, which will answer a lot of the 1099 questions. But real quick, um, what if, uh, one person has a question, what if your employees, it's a little bit of a confusing question, but I, I think I understand the gist of it. Um, what if you want to pay all the employees the standard pay for two and a half months but only utilize some of the employees throughout. So for example, 10 employees, you pay all 10 of them the full-time pay, but you only actually are working with five of them and five of them may be furloughed. Yeah, I mean, that's up to you. I mean, uh, well, the other intention is to keep people off the uh, unemployment line, right? So as long as they're getting paid, it, you're meeting the criteria established by the SBA for you to get 100% um, uh, forgiveness of the loan. Now, one key thing here is that the employees have to be, because sometimes some companies have already furloughed employees, correct? When do they have, when do they have to hire those employees back to have the loan forgiven? Yeah, so it's the mandate, I'm sorry, the, the directive is rehire quickly, right? But that rehire quickly is actually given to you until the end of June. So that's, that's it's interesting. I would have, I would have thought it'd be quicker, but it's actually till the end of June. So that the the, the goal is for you to retain 100% of your staff, or if you had to let go, you have to rehire quickly so you can get back up to full capacity uh, as of four, as of 2:15. So remember, those dates are very important. Uh, you'll have to continue to lean on your your accounting professional to to help you uh, sort that out, and your payroll company as well. So one thing to be aware of too with this, we don't have a slide for this, but you have up until two months. You have two uh, up until two months after you receive the loan. So if you receive the loan on May 1st, that means you have to be spending that money on qualified payroll expenses after May 1st. So if you've let people go, you would have to hire them back by May 1st. Is this correct, Raphael? My thought process here: you'd have to hire them back by May 1st and begin paying them going forward to show that you have the same number of employees uh, as the as the as the application as the amount you had when you applied for the loan showing 2019 income and and payroll 
No, I mean, there, if you let them go, there's no, there's reasonableness. They're not going to expect you to hire them the next day. We hire them the next day. So there's some guidance there. I'm going to try to pull up while we go on through the questions, the exact date of when you have to rehire by so that we, we have that question answered before the end of the session. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. So Eric, next we're going to be talking about 1099 contractors and give an example for them. Eric, can you run us through this? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think this is a, a one of the most common uh, examples or common questions, common client that has reached out to us are the 1099 contractors. <clears throat> now, this is going to be a, a self-employed contractor with uh, with no employees in this example, so a you know freelancer. <clears throat> So their net income for 2019 in this example is, is <clears throat> excuse me, take a drink here, is 85,000. They had $10,000 in self-employed health insurance costs in 2019. So for this calculation, we're going to take the 85k plus the 10k for 95,000 and divide that by 12. To come up with 7,917. Now, I, there's been a tremendous amount of understandable confusion, even in the firm trying to figure this out, because when they open this up to self-employed contractors, there there isn't any wages per se. There isn't any 10 uh, W-2 wages. So this is going to be based off of just net income for 2019 or there are some uh, other examples. If if you weren't in business in 2019, I've seen contractors that started up at the beginning of the year um, of 2020. You are available, you know, as long as the business started before um, February 15th, you can take uh, the income from uh, from 2020, from January 1st, 2020, to I think it's February 29th, 2020. Now, unfortunately, for what I've seen so far, the contractors in that scenario, their income wasn't very high, and it was almost better for them to seek other alternatives. But if you were in business last year, which is what this example is, the uh, the average monthly cost is going to be 7917 basically breaking up your net income by month for the year. <clears throat> Multiply that by two and a, uh, 2.5, and the max loan amount, in this scenario is going to be $19,791. And I would imagine, Darren, your light switch is blowing up with questions right now on this, <laughs> based off of yes. the last couple of weeks of questions. Yes, yes. We have some questions. So we'll answer some of the 1099 questions now. Um, what if I am an LLC and don't pay myself an official salary? I get an owner distribution. So Eric, can you answer this as an S corporation? Because as, an, as, an, as a sole proprietor or 1099 contractor, your income would be your your income. There would be no difference. But as a as an S corporation, how would that be handled? Well, no, as an S corporation, I think that uh, participant's question is directly related to an LLC, not taxed as an S corp. Because in our previous slide, the S corp will take will have wages. An S corp owner will have wages. So if you're a contractor. You know, and that's that's been the source of confusion, the language in this, because a 1099 contractor does not have pure W-2 wages. So in this, for this, the SBA is treating their net income for the year, <clears throat> taxable income for the year, as wages, and breaking that up right. as a throughout the year, you know, for a for a monthly average. Yep, that's right. Was that right? right. Yep, 100 percent. Okay, great. So again, a 1099 asked, uh, 1099 contractor asked without, to, I'm sorry, Eric? No, no, I didn't say anything. I'm good. Oh, apologize. Um, without 2019 taxes filed, uh, what supporting documents do you need to send with your application? We answered that one. In terms of that, just to reiterate on that, what supporting documents do they need to send if they haven't filed taxes in 2019? This is a contractor? A profit a and loss statement. Yep, P and L financials, 1099. Uh, if all else fails, a bank statement. But that that if all else fails, you should certainly have something. Um, 
a little bit better than the bank statement to prove your uh, 2019 income. And then as a, as a sole proprietor with no employees, is it correct that I can apply using uh, as payroll cost line 31 net profit of my Schedule C? That is exactly it. Net, net profit of, of, uh, of, for the year, for sure. Schedule C, yep, yep, yep. Okay. And then can you include amounts put to, uh, to retirement funds toward the loan? Yes, ab absolutely. In this example, we don't have it, but, you know, a lot of self-employed people will. Um, and it's our understanding that, that they can uh, put, uh, uh, retirement funding towards this. So in this example, we would add uh, to the 80, 85000 and $10,000, we would add retirement contributions to it. Okay. Now we have a three-person consulting firm with three working full-time partners. So a three-person firm with three partners and one office manager. So that's the employee. Um, the The Partners don't receive wage or salary, but they take a draw. Uh, what what do they need to show payroll for partners? Their annual income, K-1, assuming this would count toward annual payroll. I can take this, Raf. Yeah, yeah, please. This is the most tricky one. So it is, and and there is. Very, um, I, I have found no clarity on the Treasury Department in regards to this. But our our stance is, if if you're a, a partnership, in this example, three partners with one employee, <clears throat> first off, you'd be able to apply. My understanding is that you'd be able to apply on the April 3rd deadline as opposed to the April 10th deadline. But you would take. Your payroll wages, which you're paying the office manager, that would be your you know, start, and then you would add the net income for the partnership to that. So if the partnership made $100,000 in net income and you paid that office uh, manager $50,000, the the baseline for the, your calculation would be $150,000 for this loan. You would then have to, you know, add, add in any health insurance and retirement benefits that are being paid, but the baseline would be the $100,000 net income from the partnership plus the $50,000 in uh, W-2 wages to the, paid to, to the office manager. Uh, do you have anything to add to that, Raf? Do you agree with that? Or? Um, no, again, I got. I don't want to get too deep into the calculations of it all again for, for, for my stance. However, yep, yep. Um, again, yep. This, it's because it's not an underwriting event, it's a processing event. We're encouraging anybody in that situation, as long as they have the documentation and to support what they're putting in there, and it's reasonable, it will go. It should go through. Again, every bank is different on how they're processing this reasonability. Uh, but again, uh, it, it's it's got to make sense. What I've seen is some accounting firms have kind of put in a note to be included into the documents that are that are added in. For these type of scenarios, uh, obviously reach out to your accountant. Obviously, there, there's additional costs for that for their time, of course. But that helps get you to the ability to test a lot faster if you have somebody else kind of supporting what you're putting up. That's all I have on that. Okay, great. So let's move on to the next slide. And Eric, can you talk about how the 1099 contractor would be forgive their loan would be forgiven? <clears throat> Absolutely. Yeah, this is going to work exactly like the S Corp. Um, once again, 75% of uh, the loan needs to be paid in uh, in wages. In this case, you know, obviously the 1099er isn't wages, but your distributions, your draws are going to be treated as wages for this. So in that example, we had two months of payroll expense <clears throat> of 15,834. If we divided that by the total loan amount, we're going to get 80%. Um, for uh, loan forgiveness. Now, this contractor's loan, <clears throat> this contract would only need to take 14,844 in in draws in the eight-week period after funding to meet the seven to meet the 75% rule. 
and then the, the remainder 4,947 could be used for rent, utilities, and the other qualified expenses. And this uh, this loan would be 100% forgiven. Okay, great, great. Real quick, does this loan show up on your credit report? Does it, um, if it gets forgiven, does it show up as a negative on your credit report, Ralph? Uh, so, good question. This is technically a commercial loan. Uh, there is no credit being pulled for these loans, uh, and there's no commercial credit aggregating system. Uh, and and typically, commercial credit is not put on somebody's uh, uh, personal credit obligations. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so let's uh, let's see. So. Here's the repayment of the forgiven amounts. I can talk about this, and then if you have anything to add, Raph or Eric. Um, so you have two years to pay the un unforgiven loan. Uh, it's 1% max interest. There's no pre-penalty payment, and you have up to a six-month deferral, but interest will accrue. Is that correct? That's correct. Two years to pay the unforgiven loan. Uh, remember, unforgiven loan. Uh, it may never it may never turn into a loan. Uh, if it's forgiven prior to it kicking in. Uh, the interest rate, there's been a little confusion. It started off at half a percent, but it is now it is now 1% as of the start of the program. So it was never half a percent. So you didn't miss out on anything. It was never half a percent. That's kind of the initial draft, but the final guidance came out at 1% max interest rate. So again, it's close to free money as you can po potentially get. No prepayment penalty, so you can pay it back as quickly as you can. Uh, and as Darren mentioned, six months uh, of deferrals up front with interest accruing. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. So, Raf, can you talk about a little bit about the economic injury disaster loans? Sure. So, uh, this this uh, webinar has been focusing primarily on the on the Paycheck Protection Program because it's gotten the most buzz, uh, and it's going through the banking system. Uh, the Economic Injury Disaster Loan, EIDL, has actually been taking applications for almost a month now. This is an SBA direct program. I repeat, this is an SBA direct program. The banks have no uh, processing uh, of this loan at all. So you would apply directly with the SBA. It's a fairly quick four-page uh, application, uh, and it's, it's for you to use uh, if you have economic impact. So a restaurant that's had to shut down obviously has an immediate economic impact uh, and they can use this for a little bit more than just payroll and go to uh, a bigger bucket of things. Uh, and the, the initial $10,000 of this loan is now a grant. So they give this to you up front and it does not have to be repaid. Um, there are some special, uh, the system still for small businesses, less than 500, uh, sole props and contractors. There's some special waivers, personal guarantee waiver up to 200,000. So if you get a loan that's higher than that, you will need the personal guarantee with EIDL. Uh, and you have to show, and, and you don't have to show inability to obtain credit elsewhere, which is a typical standard of an SBA loan. Uh, the last thing and the most important thing is the guidance that's coming out is that you can apply for both loans but you cannot use uh, the loans for the same purpose. So if you're using PPP for, for payroll for its intended purpose, you can't use EIDL for the same thing. Uh, and there's also a feature now where you can roll into PPP EIDL if you've already gotten it. Uh, so it's an interesting dynamic little twist that's come out recently. It's still a little gray, uh, but if you already have an EIDL loan, you can roll it into PPP uh, if you have not yet applied for PPP. If you've already applied for PPP and now you want to do an EIDL, you can't roll, you can't roll it into the PPP because you've, you've already done that step. So a little confusing. Hopefully that made sense. Again, you can apply for both, but the guidance is do not use these loans for the same purpose. Any questions on this, Darren, this slide? No, no. No, not the EIDL. Yeah, there's another um, one. Yeah. Um, where where do the where do people apply for the EIDL? So EIDL is taking applications now direct at sba.gov. Do not have to go to your banker banker for this loan. So okay, let me great. wrap up EIDL real quick, Darren. Yes, there it is. I have some more info right there. So you, I think so, it applies to what you're about to say. 
Sure. EIDL, it's a, these are working capital loans, again, for a larger bucket of, of uses than PPP. For up to $2 million, small business, oh, sorry, I'm reading the same one. <laughs> EIDL is available through 12-31-2020. Uh, Here's kind of the bucket, you know, payroll, sick leave, supply cost, inventory, rent, mortgage, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, SBA pays applicant within three days of application approval. I think that's missing there, approval. Within a application approval, you still have to be approved. So um, once you get approved, SBA is doing a pretty good job getting these things funded. Uh, at this time, there's still uh, word that not too many of these have gotten approved. In my portfolio, I don't have any clients that have got EIDL or have applied for EIDL, so I don't have a firsthand example. But what we're hearing from other partners is that. Uh, the funding is still not coming through, even though the original guidance was three days within application approval. So if it hasn't been approved, I guess they can still hold on and, and say that they're still holding on to their timeline. Uh, advance, the $10,000 advance does not have to be repaid. Uh, does not have to be repaid, even if denied loan under EIDL. Will offset forgiveness under PPP loan. Advance. Correct. So they will give you $10,000 up front. If you don't qualify for the full loan amount that you're asking for at EIDL, that $10,000 becomes into a, turns into a grant, non-taxable, and you don't have to pay it back. Okay. Raf, um, in term, this is a question a lot of people have. If you get the, if you get both loans, what do you use the EIDL loan for, EIDL loan for so you don't uh, affect your PPP loan? Yeah, so just don't use it for payroll. So if you have, so there's, there's got to be some other operating costs. I think we outlined a couple of them there. Uh, inventory, if you, if you uh, have an opportunity to get inventory at, at a discounted price, you can do that. Uh, if some other working capital need that you may have that doesn't relate to payroll. Okay, gotcha. Um, so we're going to move into the commonly asked questions. And some questions I'll ask real quick to see uh, if we can get quick answers to these. Um, so one person asks, and either one of you can answer this, I'm a contractor, make 100000 my wife makes 250000 do I still qualify for the program if we still have income coming in? We're going to assume that his wife is a W-2 and he is a, he's a contractor. How would you answer that? Who are you asking? Yes, I'm sorry. Yes. <laughs> so the wife... Eric? Uh, yeah, I was just... Getting some clarity on. So the wife we'd assume is a W-2 at 250, and the husband is a contractor at 100. Is that yes? And they still have income coming in or do they from still the wife. Qualify? That was the question. Yes. Yeah. So, so this, yeah. I believe, you know, in this example, the wife's income isn't factored into this. If the husband's has suffered, you know, a uh, current economic injury to his business then absolutely can apply that that's the point in this is to uh to shore up his business with either his you know payroll or himself or rent you know to to cover expenses to the PPP and then the EIDL EIDL as well to qualify if if his business is suffering then yes I would exclude the I would ignore the wife's revenue, you know, income. Good for them that they have a due, due income, but he would still be available to uh, take advantage of these to shore up his business. One note about okay, that, that we should put out there, there's some uh, attestation. You must attest that you have an economic impact uh, and you're planning to retain your employees or you yourself have had uh, less revenue, net income coming in as a contractor. Uh, fraud is uh, something that everybody's very worried about. So again, you have to pass that reasonable test and you're attesting that you have this, you need the money, right? So I've talked to some clients and they said they're fine, they don't need the money and they're not going to apply and they're, they're just humming along. Some other are kind of on the border. So that's, that's a judgment call by you and you only. But remember, you will be attesting on that form that you have a need for this money um, and uh, if there's determined that, that there wasn't a need, and how that would be determined is TBD. Um, the government has been very explicit in saying that fraud will not be tolerated. So just heads up, 
uh, do think about it. Make sure it makes sense that you meet all the criteria. You read all the attestation that you're going to have to make before you proceed. Um, so a person asked, I derive a portion of my income from a W-2 and 42% from a 1099 uh, business, a 1099 income. Um, would they qualify for the program? Uh, if, if their business has suffered economic injury, absolutely. Right. But one, okay, you know, great. Like Ralph said, they've yeah. got to you know, show that, that, that yeah. their business has yeah. been injured. Yeah, we won't go too into that because I think we've answered that several times. But yes, you have to show economic injury. I mean, that's the number one thing. Raf, do you, is there anything else you'd like to add? Whether you, right, whether we are a contractor and derives any percentage of it, you can qualify if you have economic impact. If you are impacted by this, you can certainly you are eligible uh, to apply. But be be ready to <laughs> attest to that fact. So a person has a question. There are two dates. Uh, they said, I, 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 I could be self-employed and an independent contractor and a sole proprietorship. Well, all those are basic, all those are very similar. You're, you're a sole proprietorship. Um, but in terms of the two dates, who should wait for the April 10th date and who should wait for the, should, who should apply now? Well, the guidance is that those that are contractors well, it, on the 10th and everybody else applications are already being uh, taken. I think some of the confusion is yeah, early on. It's it said, my understanding that if you have employees. Sorry, Eric. Yeah, it's, it's been uh, my understanding that if you have employees, W-2 employees, that alone is going to enable you to apply on the third. If you don't, if you're a you know, freelancer, sole proprietor, you know, contractor, just one of you um, with no employees, then you're going to have to wait till the 10th on this. It seems like they're giving priority to paychecks, you know, in the name of it, paycheck protection. If you've got people, you know, collecting paychecks from you, then you're, uh, you get an earlier window on the third to apply. That's Raph okay. very well may have more in input on that. He's You said it well. So for the EIDL, this person has a company okay. car. Can the funds from the EIDL be used to pay the cost of the company car? Yes. I mean, that's. Uh, that's a uh, working capital, right? Uh, need. Um, so they just have to, again, prove that that's uh, a company car. It's being used for business purposes, and uh, they've been affected. So the uh, the revenues become less. So they're in danger of not being able to make that payment, and the money will help them make that payment. Great. Great. So, do distributions and dividends fall under other compensation? This is the ten, this is probably a 1065. Well, I'll let you all get to this, but do dividends and distributions fall under under co other compensation? Because in the guidance, there is a line that says other compensation, wages, tips, or other compensation. Well, it's been uh, my understanding that really draws and distributions don't factor into this at all. It is purely net income from the year because, you know, draws do not necessarily match net income for a company. You, you know, a, a sole proprietor could make $100,000 in taxable income for 2019 and pull none of that out of the company. You know, it's distinctly possible. They leave it in the business for operating capital, buy assets, buy inventory, spend it on other things, or just leave it in the bank account. So, uh, from what I've seen so far, draws and distributions don't play into this. You're, as a as a contractor, as a self-employed individual, not an S corp, you know, but as a, a tax as a sole proprietor, you're going to purely use net income from 2019, not draws or distributions. Okay, great. Thank you, Eric. And Raph might have more input. On it. No, no, no. You're you're. Uh, that's that's how we're reading it. Again, we're. Um... Uh, yes, well said. Okay, great, great. So we're getting some live questions. We're at we're at three o'clock and we're getting some live questions. We're going to go for a little bit longer. But um, Eric, do you? I think we went over some of these questions. Do you, was there anything else you want to add to some of these questions? These are questions that we got from the pre the pre uh, people who applied to the webinar 
uh, the questions I sent in. Do you have anything you want to add to these questions and answers? Yeah, I think we have. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I think we've covered all of these uh, with the, the live questions. Okay, great. So let's, um, any questions here that we can add on to? No, oh, we're happy to take any live questions for a few more minutes, Darren. I think that's uh, the next step here. Okay, sounds good. Okay, can the EIDL be used to pay off company credit card? So I, I uh, the EIDL because it's I an do not know the answer. Oh, I don't my time yeah, I don't know. I would go back and go directly to SBA.gov where they have a full breakdown of EIDL because it doesn't go through the banks. Uh, there's more limitations on my knowledge of that. If you can make a case for it as an operating expense that it, it, it is impacted uh, by the current situation, um, just be ready to to back that up. Um, how can you show health insurance expenses yeah, if it's I, claimed I, I on the? I'm sorry. Clearly, I would I would say that it clearly could be used to make minimum payments. You know that now whether it could pay off uh, you know the full balance of it, I, I wouldn't know that. But if you've got minimum you know a business credit card and there's minimum payments due and you've got to make them, then I would say that would be a, a clear use of it. Okay, so we have some some questions about uh, how some people have set themselves up as S corporations. I will say this: we won't get too into this because there is a correct way to set yourself up as an S corporation, and sometimes we see people set them up in exotic ways that will cause a lot of trouble when applying for this loan, especially if you haven't been paying yourself a reasonable salary. I will uh, post one of these questions now, see if either one of you can answer it. But it does sound a bit that way. If I'm an LLC taxed as an S corp, but don't pay myself. I'm only an employee via W-2. I paid myself a management fee via 1099 in 2019. The rest is, is K-1. Is my PPP amount based on the 1099 management fee? Uh, that, that's a, that question has got a lot packaged in there. Um, no, it is certainly not going to be based just, I mean, if, if that S-Corp, paid the owner as a 1099er as well, then uh, they've got a couple of things going here and, and they've actually got two businesses going. They've got an S-Corp, but then they're also doing something as a 1099 freelancer for that S-Corp, probably on a Schedule C on their uh, on their 1040. So if the S-Corp is, is applying, those the, the 1099 payments, aren't going to factor into it at all. It's just going to be the W-2 wages for that S-Corp owner that, you know, he or she is going to use. Yeah, that's a, that's a heavy question. I have no further guidance on that from a banking perspective, except, yeah. you know, if you're going to, if you're going to have these very exotic structures, sometimes they, they're good and sometimes they're not. Uh, seek advice from your accounting professional. If it happens to be Wendorf and Associates, I'm sure they can guide you on that. Um, uh, offline yeah definitely if you have an exotic structure definitely yeah. uh, speak with your speak with your accountant definitely speak yeah. with your accountant. they should be able to help you with that um, does the economic injury loan ha in economic injury have to be realized or can it be anticipated or feared um, I think I can answer this but please correct me if I'm wrong Raf this these economic injury loans, they generally apply to if there's an, inj an economic injury in an area, but in this situation, the economic injury is all over the country. So these loans are available to everyone at this time. Is that correct? That's correct. Yep. Okay, great, great. So yeah, so I'm sorry, Eric? That wasn't me. Okay, sorry. So yes, yeah, so it sounds like, yes, they're open to everybody at this time. There doesn't need to be an economic injury feared or shown. It's, just, it's a loan that's open to everybody. Oh. Well, folks, go on SBA.gov. There's some very strict kind of things that you have to follow. I think the guidance is you have to be experiencing an economic impact now. So if you're anticipating one, uh, I don't know how to answer that. That's a decision you're going to have to make as an individual, remember, which you're attesting to, uh, and all the uh, guidance regarding fraud. So 
take a look at SBA, read it, get comfortable with it, and make your own decision. Okay, so um, this is an S corporation. Um, the only employee they have is themselves. Are they eligible? Yeah, clearly, yes. They will use their W-2 wages, and that that is the only wages that they'll use for the uh, for the calculation. K-1 distributions do not count towards this. They won't use net income if uh, if they paid themselves a reasonable salary through the you know through payroll on a W-2. Um, that's that's what they'll use for the calculation. They'll if it was a hundred thousand dollars, they'll divide it by twelve, multiply it by two point five, and take that. Uh, I think it's twenty thousand eight thirty three. I think I've done that calculation so much in the last couple of days. I think that is twenty thousand eight thirty three for that example. Yeah, it is twenty thousand. Yes. Um, so you this know, is a speculative. Add, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Eric. And benefits will add. Oh, benefits will add. Benefits will add to that as well if they've got. Uh, Health insurance or retirement, they'll add it to that uh, W-2 wages as well to get the the monthly average. It says SBA loan. Can I use it to refund can clients canceling events? Which the EIDL? Um, the, the PPP. Let's say the PPP. No. Uh, what about the EIDL? It has more no, broad scope for them to SBA.gov. Okay, so look for guidance on SBA.gov. There's also a question about the interest on the EIDL loan. Do you, you know that, Rafa, off your head? I believe it's capped at three and three quarters. Okay. Up to 10 years. Um, can you use the EIDL to, uh, to pay for uh, S Corporation's health insurance? Again, if you can make a case for it as an operating expense and you can back it up, um, go for it. Just just remember what you're attesting to. I mean, I think that's the answer for all these EIDL questions, Darren. Okay, great. Um, Ralph, I, I have sort of a speculative question for you. My bank is recommending I use Lendio because they are so backed up. So two questions. What should a person do if their bank is not able to help them? And I guess second question, have you heard of Lendio? Uh, Lendio is a fintech company. Uh, certainly, uh, I think all options are on the table. As I mentioned earlier, it's just a, uh, a complete <clears throat> unique situation in the banking system. All banks are in this. Uh, they are getting swamped, whether it's due to internal bandwidth or just the crushing volume of applications. Um, so start with your primary bank because they already have your relationship. So they can meet KYC requirements, know your customer, which are federal regulations that are not being relaxed during this pandemic. So you still have to provide your your, uh, your um, driver's license, proof of uh, residence, all that kind of stuff, your your, uh, your corporate documents, et cetera, et cetera. So it's easier to start with your primary bank. Um, but there are some banks that are just at, at capacity. They're, uh, they're, they're not taking any more applications. You can, uh, it's all over the news. You can Google it. Some of you know who those banks are. Uh, ask your accountant to see if they have a referral to some banker that they know and trust and is, is currently accepting new customers or look at other alternatives like Lendio. Uh, but again, I think this is a very good time uh, to focus in a relationship with not only a bank, but a banker, uh, especially if you're a self-employed or a small business owner, you never know what you need until you need it. Uh, and I think most of those who have had an established banking relationship can tell you they're very, very happy with uh, how they're doing through this uh, uh, interesting period of time, but certainly all options on the table. I've heard of Lendio. It's a fintech company. Don't know much about it, but I would encourage you to, if you don't get any uh, satisfaction at your primary institution, look elsewhere. Okay, great. Well, we have we have several other questions, but we have just a little bit of time left. Um, I want to make sure we get to this slide. Um, these are some resources, and we're also going to be sending out the slides to everybody. Uh, so you can you can use this as a resource, but the Paycheck Protection Program Loan Calculator, this is one of the better ones we've found. Um, we have we listed the site for the Treasury. This is the main place we go to get PPP updates. Um, there's a lot of information out there. That is where they're getting their information from. So if you want the source, 
go to that website, which is the treasury.gov um, assistance for small business. Um, we've created a COVID-19 resource center where we'll be posting updates as we receive them both nationally and locally. We just posted a $3,000 grant, a uh, uh, forgivable loan grant that got, uh, that got posted uh, earlier this week. And then we also are working on a webinar series during this time to provide a weekly Q&A webinar uh, to just answer questions for people because we know there's a lot of, uh, just people have a lot of questions and what's going on. Um, Eric, uh, Raf, anything you want to add? Hey, I do, uh, Darren. I've been kind of uh, hogging the uh, the banking spotlight here, but I want to say that this presentation sure. has been really, really good. Uh, the PowerPoint presentation is practical. It's I've got a pragmatic approach to it. Got a lot of good information and resources, so well done to you. I've seen some others that aren't as good as this. So uh, folks that are on the webinar, please take this uh, PowerPoint presentation, digest it. It's got a lot of great stuff. And do rely on your uh, accounting profession to kind of provide some more guidance. Uh, because some of you that have some of these unique setups or are independent contractors, this is also a time when you, you need to uh, lean on those accounting relationships. And if you don't have one, find one, uh, because they're very important. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Raf, for, for participating and, and Eric as well. All right, everybody. So we'll send out more info via the via our newsletter. And also we'll send out info directly to everyone who attended this webinar. And thank you every thank you very much, everyone, and, and please be well. Please be well. Take care. Thank you, Raf. Thank you, Eric. Thank you. Thank you.